So thanks, everyone. If you catch me looking at my phone, it's just to keep myself honest on time. But um, I, I thought it might be helpful just to give you a, a quick background, both into my, my, myself and my career path at Cisco, because I think it illustrates uh, in a pretty natural way the evolution of the legal operations practice in-house. In so I started my legal career as a technology licensing lawyer. And uh, relatively early in my, my tenure at Cisco, which is coming up on its 19th year, uh, our general counsel, a, a, a man named uh, Mark Chandler, I had the very good fortune that Mark approached me and said, listen, uh, we have this operational problem and I, I think you might be the one to solve it. I'd like you to, to consider taking a, a role in the legal operations space. And my first reaction to that is, what a career limiting move is this? What did I do wrong? Did I screw up some sort of transaction? You know, what could possibly motivate me to leave my high powered legal career to go focus on legal operations. But it turned out to be a, a very serendipitous thing for me. It's worked out very well because educationally, my background was in electrical engineering with an emphasis in information systems. And then I had a legal background to marry up to that. And at the time when Mark approached me with this opportunity back in 2006, he assigned me a, a staff of three people and said, I want you to operationalize the work that we do. I want you to use all of the, the systems analytics and, and data analysis skills that you have to, to unpack our legal department. Uh, skipping ahead, uh, Cisco is currently a department of about 400 legal professionals and I manage about 20% of the legal department. So uh, I, I say that not to be self-aggrandizing, but to illustrate the level of investment that organizations like Cisco are making, into, uh, making in this career path, in this track. And the reason that I'm here is I have a talent problem. I've got a pipeline problem. And we are invested in, in the genesis of, of iFlip so that we can hopefully solve that problem through a combination of things. I want more law schools participating. Uh, I want more uh, organizations like mine hiring people out of this program so that we can create the demand. And I want to do a lot of best practice sharing. That's the reason I'm here. It's, it's as simple as that. I work in Silicon Valley. We're an outcome-based uh, culture. It's all about what you deliver. What, the things you talk about are only interesting to the marketing people and that gets a fair amount of attention. But at the end of the day, what separates the most successful organizations is the ability to deliver and to collaborate. If you think about some of the technologies that you rely on every day, things like wireless access, that depends on a standard, the 802.11 standard. The reason that the 802.11 standard is important is we as technology companies all agreed on a single taxonomy and protocol for communicating information. It's the reason that you can open up your HP laptop or your Dell laptop or your IBM PC or your Apple phone and communicate using wireless technologies in a, in a collaborative way that's useful across the enterprise. IT companies in Silicon Valley depend on expanding the size of the market at the same time that we focus on growing our share in the market. So I want you to focus on the why piece of it. I gave you the first piece. It's I have a talent problem, and I think you can help me solve this. The second is to understand why a legal department exists internally. Why do we create these pseudo uh, law firms, these captive law firms, if you will? I agree that that's the wrong approach, but why are legal departments growing in size faster than law, fir than law firm employers are growing? I think the, the, the key to that is to understand the mission of an in-house legal department. The only reason we exist is to facilitate our organization's ability to design, build, and sell its products in a legally appropriate way. Now contrast that with the reasons why individual lawyers feel like they exist. I'm not going to pretend to to project onto them what those mission statements are, but I would ask, you know, every time I have asked lawyers that, that work for us outside to give me the reason for their existence, it often ties into something related to billing. That's not an outcome-based measurement. That's an input-based measurement. And so when we look at programs like IFLP, IFLP, we're looking to hire lawyers that have a mindset that's compatible with the goals that we have to deliver. Right? We have to assist our company's ability to design, build, and sell our products in a legally appropriate way. The only reason I get paid every month 
is we have some really talented engineers that are out designing products and we have some really uh, energetic and engaged salespeople that are selling those products, hopefully to all of you. And my sole purpose for existence is to support them. I am a service organization to them. So if, if we look at this differentiation requirement on talent, we have to ask ourselves, is the current pipeline set up for success? In any other supply chain analysis that we would do, we would look at our existing supply chain, we'd look at their capabilities, and we would make sure that they have the ability to design or deliver enough components for us to deliver our products to meet customer demand. Um, one of the things that we struggle with right now as a company is there is a, is a shortage of the ability to acquire the required memory chips that we need for our, for our product set. It's a supply chain problem. I'm here to address the legal supply chain problem. I need you all to work with me to come up with a way to increase the pipeline of these T-shaped lawyers. Um, there will always be a place for the I-shaped lawyer. Um, bless them for what they do. They're necessary. We consult them. We want them to be there. But there's an existing pipeline to train those people. To get the, the pipeline that we need for in-house legal practice is going to require a, a different approach to thinking. And um, a, as a result of that, we engaged very early with the Tech Lawyer program at Colorado. I'm, I'm proud to say that we were one of the original investors in that program. I've been part of the, the faculty from that from the very beginning. And now I just want to, I want to expand it. What's the quickest way to expand it? For every one of you that's an employer in here, you need to hire interns. You need to hire interns out of this program. And if you do, I can promise you that you're going to have some outcomes that are, that are different, potentially, um, than hiring through your traditional models. We've done both. Uh, our, our historical practice has always been to hire directly out of law school, or sorry, from law firms, not, not from out of law school. In fact, uh, the first lawyer that we hired directly uh, out of law school had kind of an interesting pedigree. He was a Princeton undergrad, went to Harvard Law, and was a law clerk to Justice Jackson on the Microsoft antitrust case at a time when Cisco uh, was under a fair amount of pressure because we had some pretty significant market share and people were trying to analogize our practices to Microsoft <laughs> even though they were completely separate. <laughs> Monopolies are not illegal. Behaving as a monopolist is illegal. Um, but let, suffice it to say, the reason we were interested in this one particular intern or this one particular student coming directly out of law school was a, a relatively narrow fact pattern. We hired that, that uh, lawyer, if I remember correctly, about 16 years ago. We haven't hired another person directly out of law school until this past year. And the person that we hired was, came directly from the IFLIP program, the predecessor program, at T, the TLA program at Colorado. So let me, let me just focus on the outcomes. Let me, let's look at it. In 2015, we hired three seven-month interns. I am a tremendous advocate. Well, maybe I'm that self-aggrandizing. Maybe I'm not tremendous, but I'm, a, uh, I'm an ardent advocate of, the, of the, my preference for seven-month interns. Um, I believe strongly that when you take 10-month interns, you're going to spend about, or, sorry, 10-week interns, you spend about half the time getting them set up with computers and, and getting them established. Um, we have learned over time that we get the vast majority of our benefit from the intern community comes in the last half of the internship. And if we can extend those internships to seven-month programs instead of 10 weeks, we get a commensurate level of benefit. So let's just look at uh, my seven-month interns over the, the past three years, from 2015 to 2017. What you see is pictures of these individuals and their current employers. One thing I'd hope you take away from this is that none of them are in, quote, law-advantaged careers. Right? A hundred percent of our seven-month interns have been placed in the legal careers that they wanted to pursue as part of their intake conversation with me. One of the things I invest in quite a bit is to, to walk through a career progression with each of our interns and, and really get an understanding of where they hope to arrive professionally. So at the, at the top, we had a couple of lawyers that wanted to go in-house. In 2015, the, the legal operations career path was still a bit in flux, despite the fact that I started in 2006. Um, 
and we had one of our lawyers, that, one of our interns that w wanted desperately to go in-house as a business development general counsel at early stage companies. That's precisely where they were able to go. In the second year, uh, similarly, we were able to place all of our interns. And then in our 2017 interns, Chris Ivey, this incredibly handsome guy with the blue tie, uh, actually joined my team as a full-time employee directly out of law school. I, again, I emphasize that that's the second time in, call it, 17 years that we have hired directly out of law school. Why are we doing that? Because this program exists to give students the skill sets they need to come in-house and be able to contribute immediately. It's a different path to a very successful career. And frankly, it allows me to, to groom those students and, and further uh, educate them in the way Cisco does business as a legal operations organization. Again, we're here to help the business design, build, and sell products, as opposed to retraining someone about the vagaries of, of e-billing systems and keeping track of their time. There's one other uh, example that I'll use, and, and that just kind of illustrates the importance of context. And I, I use it because this individual did not come from a law firm, but came to us through an acquisition. Uh, so some of you may have read uh, online, uh, she's a very prolific author now, uh, the works of Jennifer McCarran. Jennifer McCarran built a career in the, in the knowledge management space. Jennifer McCarran uh, joined Cisco uh, in a very non-traditional way. We acquired the company she worked for, and at the time she was working for the general counsel as a project manager. Um, a big part of her, her career um, obligations at that point uh, were to be an administrative assistant to, to the general counsel. She spent five and a half years in my department before she, uh, unfortunately for me, decided to leave. The reason she left was she went to go take the legal operations lead role at a company called Spotify. She spent 15 months, I believe it was, at Spotify and just recently announced that she is taking the legal operations lead role at another small company called Netflix. Okay, this is a person over the course of a six year career path moved from being uh, a project manager slash administrative assistant to heading legal operations at a, at a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, I don't say any of this to, to be self-aggrandizing in any way. The reason I share this is that the context we work in is important. And the interns that you'll be hiring out of this program have the context that are that have the context that is necessary to continue to be successful. So these are, these are where they are now, I guess, my, my historical crop of interns. These are the interns that I have now. Where will they go? We have, uh, we have four uh, interns from the iFlip program. This is from the latest round of, of the boot camp uh, from Indiana, and we have one from, from Colorado. Uh, I made other j offers to, uh, to a couple of Northwestern students, but because we were just rolling up the program and getting it staffed in time, uh, they were under time pressure to make some decisions on offers, and unfortunately, they made poor decisions and didn't join my department. <laughs> um, but you know, let's hope that the next crop will be taught a little bit better through the boot camp process. They'll be ready to accept the offers that are on the table that are, are more sensible. Let me, let me just close with one thing. Um, this is not a charity exercise. right? Um, I pay these lawyers, or these future lawyers, $42 an hour to be interns. Do the math on that. It's an investment in a career path for you law students that are out here. If you have a bent towards this type of work, I encourage you to continue to pursue it. Uh, I, again, I've had the very good fortune of working for one of the most uh, progressive general counsels in this space. Uh, Mark has is, is been a delight to work for, and I'm not saying this just because it's being recorded, but that helps. Um, <laughs> Mark has, has provided a, an enormous amount of, of mentoring, not only to me, but to the industry in this space. This is a valid career path. For you employers, though, it's also a valid talent pool. And I hope you'll take advantage of, of the students that come out of the program. And the best way to make that happen is to commit to signing up interns. I take every seven-month intern nearly that I can get. Um, from a quantity perspective. This year, I've committed to hiring at least six. I'd like it to be 10. Thanks. <laughs>